All right, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Lee, I'm a, a technology reporter at Fox, and um, I'll be moderating this panel on cybersecurity. Um, and there's been uh, a lot of news over the last year or so. Um, you know, a little over a year ago, we had the, the big target breach, which had about 70 million um, customers affected. Then eBay had a big breach um, last summer. Um, we had the celebrity photos, um, ha photos hacked from a number of celebrities. And then we had, of course, the, the big Sony pictures hack. And so um, I think it's very clear that uh, being able to better secure our networks is important. Um, and uh, the, you know, these problems are only going to continue coming up. And because our, as our economy becomes more uh, integ integrated into the uh, you know, digital networks, um, these issues are only going to get more uh, important. Um, and so I've got a great panel here of uh, experts on this topic, some from government, some from India, industry, some from academia. Um, we have uh, Chris Breuer. He's the Assistant Vice President for Global Public Policy at AT&T and um, also s serves on NIST's Internet Security and Privacy Advisory Board. Um, we have Alan Friedman. He's a research scientist at uh, George Washington University and has computer science degree and a public policy degree. Um, we have Siobhan Gorman, uh, who's at the Brunswick Group and was previously a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, we have Angela McKay uh, from Microsoft. And uh, we have Ari Schwartz, who does cybersecurity issues at the White House. Um, so Ari Schwartz, I'd like to start with you. Uh, we had, um, in 2013, there was a cybersecurity bill that was uh, came up for debate, and it, it was not passed, I think, in part because the um, president had some uh, concerns about it. There was a, a veto threat. Um, and I know now he's, um, su he's supporting, uh, presumably, a somewhat different piece of legislation. I wonder if you could talk about kind of what's changed between um, what was being discussed in Congress um, in 2013 um, and what the president's hoping to see this year. So, uh, I mean, for, for the White House's view on this, it goes back to the 2011 when we put out our first legislative package on this uh, on these set of issues. And in that set of package, we had about, um, I think there were seven pieces of legislation, four of which actually ended up passing this, Congre this last Congress. So we feel as we've made some really good progress on uh, getting some of that legislation through. Uh, but there's still three pieces that uh, have, have not moved forward. Um, one of those is, is on information sharing, which is the one that Tim is uh, um, referring to. Uh, the president has been, has been adamant that uh, information sharing is a, uh, is a top priority moving forward, and we need to find ways to increase voluntary sharing of information from the government to the private sector, uh, among the private sector, and from the private sector into government. And uh, really, uh, the, uh, there are a number of bills that have tried and attempts to do that. Uh, the, some, the, the key points to those bills have been, you know, there have been differences um, for a wide range of reasons. Uh, the one that, that Tim, that you're talking about is, uh, is CISPA um, that uh, raised a lot of concerns within, uh, within the administration uh, and we put out a, a statement of administration uh, policy on that uh, particular bill. Um, that raised some major concerns with it. Uh, in particular, uh, we were really concerned um, around the idea that it did not protect privacy and civil liberties well enough for an information sharing bill when you're sharing information into the government and you're uh, give, giving liability to protection from other privacy bills, privacy laws. So the question is what privacy rules apply to this information? That is a key point for any, privacy, any information sharing bill moving forward in this space that we're going to look at. Number two, we wanted to make sure that, it, that the information that comes from the private sector to the government is coming in through a civilian portal or a civilian place. And the, the, the main reason for that is so that we can do oversight of it, right? It's much more difficult to do oversight if it comes into the intelligence community or other, other places uh, where, the, where there's less public uh, ability to see into what, what is being shared and how that information is being used within the government. So a key point is, is to that civilian uh, piece of this, so that's that's a key point for us moving forward. And then number three uh, is that the, the liability protection that is given is targeted because we feel there's a lot of secondary consequences to creating really, really broad liability protections in this space. So if we can target it to the information, to the act of sharing that information, uh, we would end up uh, in a better place. We had some of that in our 2011 package, but um, through the process of working with both the House, uh, House and Senate on different bills in this space, uh, there was really a desire to, to show more of what we wanted and, and, and to answer some of the questions that came from our 2011 bill and from 
this uh, CISPA Statement of Administration Policy. And uh, the bill that we put out uh, last month really was aimed at uh, answering those questions, going into more detail on those three points in particular. Um, and could you, can you say a little bit more about what the kind of shape of the privacy and civil liberties protections um, in, in that package um, and what, what the kind of key aspects of it are? Sure. So, I mean, the <laughs> Homeland Security, uh, the, the, the Secretary of Homeland Security and Attorney General are required to develop uh, information sharing uh, procedures that govern the receipt, the retention, the use, and disclosure of that information, uh, very clearly stating out how that should be done within the federal government and how that will be overseen. As I was saying earlier, a key point to that is how much can we, can we raise to the public to, to make this public and the oversight of that, that uh, done in, a, in public view. Um, number two, uh, that it's done, that there's a review by the PCLOB, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, right, and that they're involved in the process. And uh, one step that we made that was different from the past versions of this is we had brought them earlier into the process because we found that working with the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board on a range of issues um, that it's very useful to, to give something to, to them in advance. They give us some uh, advice. We make changes based on that. Then we put it back out, and uh, they give a viewpoint of it after they've seen it and had a chance to um, go back and forth with us on it. And they, they seem to like to do that, so we wanted to, to do that as well. So um, uh, lastly, I mean, I think one, one important point here is um, tying in the, the, the idea of the the data breach bill that we also put out along with the information sharing bill, uh, which w we feel is uh, will help to get more information made public and to, to users uh, out there uh, as we move forward in notification and, and to streamline that process for notification, which we think can help to uh, address some of the issues related to breaches as well, so that users make sure, that, make sure making sure that users are informed um, as well when, when they're involved in a breach and that notification is passed on as well. So those are just some areas. Thanks. Um, I want to go to Angela McKay to uh, talk about um, one of the very basic questions about this that I've never been quite as clear about as I would like is um, like concretely like what when we're talking about information sharing um, what types of information are we talking about needing to be shared and um, what specific liabilities because I know the the, the uh, 2013 bill, there were concerns that it had this very broad um, immunity, which made it kind of not clear, you know, which presumably the concern is you share information and there's some kind of privacy lawsuit. But it was never clear to me, like, exactly which kind of lawsuits um, people were afraid of and what kind of information they wanted to be shared. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Certainly. Um, and when you talk about the types of information that should be shared, the first thing to think about is not just a list of enumerating different types of information. The first qualifier there should be, what is the type of player set that you're looking to exchange information between? And what are their capabilities to understand things like threats and vulnerabilities and act on threats and vulnerabilities? Because sharing all information with all different player sets does not actually help improve security, actually increases risks. So there are players who have uh, better able ability to act on information, um, and particularly act at scale. So for example, organizations like AT&T and Microsoft are gonna be able to cons both produce, consume, and use information in different ways than my sister who owns a uh, chiropractic small business in Atlanta, Georgia is going to be able to do. So you have to think a little bit about the different players and their need sets. So when you are talking in this space, there is broad sharing for the super set of users, things that really help people understand the nature of threat. You hear things like malware signatures. That is something that will help people um, protect them, their own systems. When you think about organizations who have higher capabilities, that is a space where you want to think more about not just the malware signatures, but also heuristics or things that might be the um, nature of an emerging threat. So what are you seeing as behavior on network that might actually indicate that there's a threat that is occurring? That also then translates to the kind of liability space. Um, we don't believe that blanket liability protections are going to um, create the kind of right balance and encourage and incentivize the appropriate behaviors in this space. We do think that when you're thinking about liability protection that one, it has to do with the sharing piece that Ari brought up, so liability protection for sharing information. And then another piece that we think about is what are the liability protections for either taking action 
or not taking action on information received. You know, there's a really sticky point of if I receive something and I didn't take action, what are the implications there? And I think we have to think really carefully about those liability protections and what is going to be the appropriate balance in that space. Mm. So just, just to try to make this concrete, if you have like a malware signature um, and you share it with the government or with other companies that might be facing the same malware, um, what's an example of somebody who might sue you or for doing that or for not doing that, that uh, where legislation would actually be needed? Because I assume in most cases it's legal to share malware signatures across companies. So there are, um, different people have different understanding and perception about the, what the scope of exceptions are. And so that's really important is, you know, everyone could look at the same series of words and come up with a different understanding of what those exceptions are. The kind of sharing that goes on industry to industry, I think, does not create the same degree of concerns on the privacy and civil liberties front as you have on the industry to government side. But the industry to industry piece does create a series of concerns about, well, are they using this uh, for competitive advantage within a particular industry? Some of the liability protections that you would want in the case of some industry to industry sharing is ensuring that you know if you are sharing a malware signature that has to do with a command and control server um, and locating that command and control server is that you're not really um, breaking your existing contracts with customers. And so we do have contractual commitments to customers. We have exceptions inside of that. We do not want to break those contractual commitments. And we don't need liability protection to do that, but that's one of those balance points of we want liability protections, but not so far that we aren't remaining commitments, uh, keeping our commitments to customers. Okay, but then what, what's a, a law you might be breaking? And I'm trying to figure out, like, what, presumably there is some set of laws that some companies would like to share certain kinds of information except for those laws. And I'm just trying to get a concrete example. I mean, so maybe uh, is antitrust one of them? Are you thinking about there being an antitrust lawsuit if there was too much sharing? There, there are, and, and this gets to where um, I'm not necessarily saying these are a series of Microsoft concerns, but rather the concerns that I hear from different segments in industry and different sure. partners. So antitrust concerns are one. You know, there are regulatory concerns <coughs> about sharing with government. There's a series of concerns that I hear from different segments of industry that varies. Um, I do think that in particular when you look at the sharing that goes on within the IT sector and among, for example, organizations like mine and antivirus um, organizations, we have not found ourselves to be as constrained in this space as I think other sectors who have different regulatory backgrounds. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, let, let me go to see about Gorman. Uh, do you have any sense for how um, you know, there's been a lot of attack, attacks, probably Sony's the, the most high-profile one. Um, how has this changed the culture of companies? Um, are, are companies paying more attention to these issues than they did a few years ago? Um, and if so, what are they kind of doing um, to uh, make themselves more secure? Uh, I think that 2014 was certainly a, um, a time period that brought this issue to the forefront for a whole range of companies. And I think that the Sony hack was the most high profile and in some ways uh, the most alarming simply because you had a situation where um, hackers were able to get into the system and they were actually able to destroy data um, and obviously also post a lot of embarrassing information, which definitely gets uh, almost any CEO's attention. Um, but what you saw in 2004 was a whole wide range of companies companies getting hit. So it, it almost, uh, you know, it conveyed the message that, that almost any industry sector could end up being uh, a victim of these kinds of, um, you know, hacking events. And so I do think that it's, it's, it's raised a level of concern. Um, we certainly saw reports out of uh, Davos, I think it was last week, um, you know, how it was on the minds of almost every CEO there. And that's obviously a very high level uh, gathering of, of CEOs. And so I think that now, companies are starting to think about, well, what, what is it that we need to do? What is it that we can do? What are we obligated to do by law? What are we obligated to do uh, just in terms of our, our commitments to either our customers or investors uh, or our, you know, our, our boards? And so I think that what 2014 did was really elevate this issue. And now it really is kind of a, a CEO and, and board level discussion. Uh, and I think that at this point, companies are trying to figure out which pieces of the cyber problem they need to kind of go after first, because there's also 
also kind of a growing appreciation that this is a, a pretty wide ranging set of issues. Um, you know, not only are you concerned about, uh, you know, potentially people getting inside your system, but you also want to make sure that you are doing sort of the day to day internal uh, security maintenance and making sure your employees are educated, um, which is sort of a different set of um, challenges and issues that the companies are looking at. So I think that they're actually, they're, they're starting to take a fairly holistic approach, but it's, it's just the beginning. So, um, so you said uh, training employees. Um, what are in, con in specific terms, like are hiring more security professionals? Is it adopting different technology? Like, what what kinds of things are you seeing them do? Um, I think you're seeing them uh, look at ways that they can upgrade their internal security systems. I mean, one thing that that you hear um, uh, officials in government talk a lot about is you, you know 80% of the the cyber security incidents could actually be prevented with just sort of proper hygiene of your systems. I do think that companies are looking at that, but also looking at ways to make sure that employees are well educated to uh, help implement those kinds of things uh, because a lot of the cybersecurity uh, issues that companies run into have a big human component. Humans are being tricked to, to, to click on this link or, uh, you know, visit this website or something like that and that ends up being a risk to the company. Um, so I, you, you see those kinds of things. You also just sort of see them looking at the notion of getting hacked and that sort of the consequences that follow from that as being much more of a reality um, and starting to think about, you know, well, are there ways that we need to protect our data better. Um, you know, what are the actual, you know, proper standards uh, and best practices and, and trying to really educate themselves on that. And I think this is this is across, you know, the financial sector, the retail sector, um, and in, in sort of both small and medium sized companies. It's it's interesting even some of the 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 not necessarily fortune, you know, one hundred or even five hundred companies that are starting to look at this. Um, so, Alan Friedland, let me ask you, uh, we were talking before the panel and, and um, ab about uh, to, to what extent are these attacks even preventable? I mean, it's very easy to say, okay, Sony was hacked, that means they must have had terrible security. I mean, that might be true, but it also might just be that the North Korean government or whoever spent a ton of money um, trying to, uh, you know, hack them, and that any company that was targeted like that might have been vulnerable. Um, so how do we tell if a company is actually doing enough? Are the company, is there a point at which, um, you know, we've done enough and we just need to accept that these things happen? Or is it reasonable to think we could live in a future where companies are generally invulnerable to these kinds of attacks and um, these, these kinds of hacks just don't show up sure. so much? So those of you who are familiar with the economics of risk might know the name Richard Zeckhauser, who uh, famous for saying, uh, the optimal number of plane crashes is greater than zero. Uh, we're going, we, if, if we live in a world without security incidents, uh, we have spent far too much on security and we've probably reached uh, Jonathan Zittrain's nightmare of all just having electronic toasters and nothing else. Uh, but it's also important to remember that just because a company has a breach doesn't mean that they failed. They, they didn't invest enough. Where we are today is I think that we have the beginning of market solutions for security. And I think uh, most of us, even those who uh, want a larger role from government, still say ultimately the solution is going to come from the private sector. So the question is then naturally, why isn't the market working? And I think that there are uh, some failures on the supply side, some failures on the demand side. Um, just very, very briefly, on the demand side, it's unclear what a manager should care about. Uh, we know that you know, already managers have a hard time uh, balancing short-term earnings expectations against long-term investment. Um, but even then, we, you know, the Sony CEO said, we can cover this breach out of our operating budget. And he expressed uh, confidence that his insurance will, will cover the incident. We, we will find out whether that's true or not in the coming months. Uh, but so, so, you know, trying to get the attention of a board, and then even if you do have the attention of senior management, um, those of you who've been to uh, a security trade show, you wander out onto the floor of RSA or Black Hat, and everyone is willing to sell you the same box that they sold you, tried to sell you last year, but this time it's for this year's threat. You know, the thing that used to help you with data breach prevention is now gonna help you against APT. Uh, understanding how those pieces fit together is tricky. Um, 
And so the, we're, we're sort of left with this situation of what is the first step? Uh, I think there is some evidence even that Sony was moving in this direction. They had been previously sanctioned by just about everyone uh, for large amounts of information security failures. So they said, hey, let's bring in managed security provider. This is great. It's the, it's the cloud equivalent of security. I don't know enough to bring in the best security people. And frankly, the best security people are way too expensive for me to hire. So I'm going to bring in a vendor who's going to cover my entire solution. That's great except they forgot that their internal managers still have to pick up the phone and read their reports every so often. So even something like that still requires an organizational capability. Um, so uh, so the, the optimal number is greater than zero. I mean, do we, do we know that it actually um, is, is it possible that this actually, we are actually close to the optimal number of um, security incidents? I mean, so there's, you know, there's thousands of companies in the, in the country and I, I don't, I haven't done the numbers, but certainly the fact that there was one very high profile Sony breach, right. if only one of those happens a year, maybe that's totally fine. So, so I, I think you can look at the nature of the breach and do two things. One, look at the near misses, and then two, look at the less successful breaches. So near misses, um, uh, Home Depot. Uh, right, was hit with an attack. They used one, they used the same type of attack as was used against Target. Six months later, Home Depot wasn't prepared. Two, uh, from what we know, the attackers actually screwed up. They could have compromised every single point of sale terminal in the entire uh, network, and in fact, for some reason, they only went after the self-checkout point of sale terminals. Uh, so it could have been a whole lot worse. Uh, but also, from a, a recovery mechanism, uh, the CEO of Target got fired. You know what happened to the senior leadership at Home Depot? They got shiny new iPhone 6s, which they talked about because these are more secure. Uh, so now let's take a look at Sony versus Sands Corporation. I don't know if anyone's read the report that Business Week put out. If anyone knew that Sands Corporation got hit. Uh, so very short version. It was actually had a lot of similarities. It's a very strong international relations component. The CEO of Sands, a very an uncontroversial figure named Sheldon Adelson gave a speech uh, <laughs> suggesting uh, a certain approach to America's policy towards nuclear Iran, and uh, that was not met with applause in Iran, and a month later someone tried to break into the network. Uh, and from what we know about it from public sources, uh, they worked very hard. Uh, it was probably related to the foreign actor, but probably wasn't the government. Uh, and they were able to do some damage, but it was contained. Because the structure of the network was built such that you couldn't break everything all at once. And also the SANS had an on-site team that was able to pull the emergency button, let's take things offline. And as a result, you didn't hear about you know, uh, slot machines spitting out money in the middle of a casino in Macau. Uh, and we didn't hear much about it at all. So what we can look and say, listen, there are lots of attacks, but at least they shouldn't be catastrophic attacks. If someone wants to hit you, they'll probably hit you. What you can do is make sure that they don't knock you out forever. And, and one thing that the SANS example actually shows is that there can be market forces that create incentives. I mean, casinos have enormous incentive to have very strong cybersecurity because they're obviously handling an awful lot of money. Uh, and, you know, Sony is handling a lot of things in addition to uh, money and data and things like that. And so I think that, that that does show sort of the way in which incentives can work um, and maybe would provide lessons down the line for how to, how to tweak incentives maybe to have a, a, a have it apply to a broader range of folks in the private sector. So, so one related question to that that I want to ask Alan about as well is, um, so, so companies I think are pretty good at, at figuring out their own risk and managing it, buying insurance. I mean, hopefully, they, they at least have the right incentive. Um, but they also have cases like the Target and Home Depot breach, where a lot of the cost is um, customers uh, having their identity stolen, um, you know, maybe having, uh, you know, having to deal with that sort of thing. Um, to what extent are um, is, is the, uh, are, are there changes needed to make sure the companies are taking proper account of third parties that are harmed when their, their networks are hacked? So, so I'm going to be slightly controversial and say the third parties are not consumers. Uh, we in this country have excellent consumer protection laws. Uh, if I you know, wake up and all of the money from my bank account has been sent to Moldova, I get it back up to the FDIC limit. I'm not worried about anyone stealing my credit card ever. Uh, because I don't have, I have maximum $50 liability. Um, where we are starting to see some pushback is whether or not the third parties include banks. 
Uh, and that is a huge area that is, gets into very arcane contracts that are quite old of understanding where liability lies. And just to give an idea of the complexity, uh, there are different liabilities based on whether the fraud is committed with a swipe or without a swipe. If someone steals my credit card and then just generates a new credit card, which by the way, anyone with w one semester of engineering under the belt can do for about $500 off an eBay purchase, can just make their own credit cards. Uh, and so you steal my credit card number, you make an identical credit card and you swipe it. Well that, the bank pays for. However, if uh, they just use it online, well then the merchant pays for it. Uh, so there are very complex rules and once we bring in chip and pin, uh, it's going to get even more complex. Uh, and this is, I think, fascinating for those of you who like uh, politics because these don't hew along traditional political lines. Uh, if you remember the fight about swipe fees, uh, as, as part of um, the, uh, the deb debit card swipe fees, thank you. Uh, it's, it's basically you have the merchants versus the banks uh, and, and someone's going to end up bearing a lot of exposure and I think it's going to be settled on the hill. Um, Chris Boyle, let me, let me ask you about the international dimension of this. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of these hacks, the, um, the Sony hack, for example, is North Korea was suspected. Um, is, are there things that need to be done to, um, to have com countries or um, companies that are, work across borders um, cooperate more along, uh, across borders in order to address these kinds of attacks? Well, I certainly think that's the case. I mean, if you look at the, the Sony attack, it was basically a nation state attacking a, a private company in the United States. So I think that one of the issues that has to be dealt with, and maybe Ari can speak to this a little bit more, is the idea that, you know, how do we help these companies out? How does, what, how does the government partner with the private sector in that situation to deal with the attacks? There's, there's an element of, you know, what we saw in response to the Sony situation, I'm kind of blaming the company and saying that, hey, they're, they're a victim as well, as much as anybody else is in that situation. So um, and there's a need, I think, for some sort of international pact. And um, last week there was some reporting in Politico about um, uh, Chris Painter in the administration at the State Department talking about um, some new um, efforts that were going on to kind of create more of a more of an international cooperative pact between some of the countries that are you know countries of the willing and are willing to do that, and I certainly think that's necessary. Pursuing some of those those efforts and going after some of the cyber criminals internationally is something that has to be done because you can't expect every like like as folks have been talking about on the panel. I mean, you're not going to get to a point where there's zero attacks, and if you have a determined attacker from that's well funded and comes from a nation state, I think it's likely that you're going to continue to see some of those attacks. So having the proper framework in place to respond is something I think that would be very important. And what, what would you? Uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I was just going to add in maybe an example here, because um, earlier you asked for example, and I think this one's this this is a good place to demonstrate one, which is, you know, the the idea of reciprocity and in information sharing, I think, is going to be a really interesting discussion for those of us who operate not only across basic borders, but also are operating on a global basis. Uh, a clear example here, and I've seen bills that have done this, which is let's report all vulnerabilities to the government. So then we'll have a big catalog of all the vulnerabilities sitting with governments who sometimes use vulnerabilities not just to protect users, but also to serve and uh, advance other objectives, national security objectives. So if we report all vulnerabilities into governments, so say the US government does, says that we should do that, and then the British government says that we should do that, and then the Chinese government says that we should do that, and the Indian government says that we should do that. What you've done is you're basically helping weaponize the vulnerability space because they're all going to call for the same policy, and then you're going to be creating, uh, basically providing information that can help exploit systems. And so as people craft not only information sharing legislation, but also other things in cybersecurity, you do have to think quite a bit about what would happen if another government asked us to do the exact same thing. Yeah, and I, well, I, I don't disagree with that, but I think, I think the concept of having a strategy of how to deal with these incidents and, how, and what, what should we be doing to try to address these situations is something that has to be dealt with at some point. Oh, it, it also points to a, a challenge I think that the government is going to continue to grapple with and is going to have to at some point find the right balance. Um, the, the NSA review panel, for example, came out and said that there shouldn't actually be sort of a, a stockpiling of these kind of vulnerabilities or, or attack vectors. Um, and, you know, the, the intelligence agencies uh, fought, fought back uh, against that to some extent because it's taking away a, a capability that they're seeking. And so there is that tension between national security priorities and um, sort of 
cybersecurity priorities that is, I think, every government's going to be struggling with, but certainly the U.S. government will be. So, I, and I, I'm skeptical that at least uh, you know, our government is going to be looking for, you know, uh, sister-in-law's uh, uh, chiropractic thing. Oh, well, she didn't patch this. We can get in this way. Uh, but I think there's a very real tension from a governance perspective uh, because we want data for two reasons. Well, one, as a researcher, just please give me all your data. So I like the, uh, as, a, as a researcher, I love the Brussels plan to just have every incident be reported. As a policy scholar, I agree it's a terrible idea. Um, but I think there's a very real tension between uh, transparency to promote better policy, to respond to the information. And transparency is a form of accountability. They're, they're in natural, natural tension. Because in one, you're trying to promote people to work together. Uh, whereas in the other one, you're saying, listen, okay, do, if you do bad things, we're going, you're going to pay a cost. So this is going to discourage you from doing bad things. That's great. It works, you know, I'm an economist, I love that. But at the same time, it also means that your organizational posture shifts. And, you know, Chris and Angela's chief counsel now are basically looking over their shoulder every time they're gonna talk to someone and, and, and use, do something useful. I, I just wanna push back on something. I, I mean, it, it, it sounded, Siobhan, like what you were saying was that there's, and, and uh, I think maybe what Chris was saying too, is that there's this, uh, vast stockpile of vulnerabilities that the U.S. government has that we do not disclose, that it could not be further from the truth. The vast, vast majority of, disclose, of, of vulnerabilities are disclosed to the, to the, the company, the vendors that, whose, whose products they are, uh, um, they, they uh, apply to and to the public uh, at large. So uh, I think we have a, a process for doing that and putting that in place uh, that is, ha is actually working quite well at this point. I think um, there's more that we could do in that space, but I, I wanted to dispel this idea that the U.S. government is stockpiling vulnerabilities. I, th I think we might be conflating issues a little bit too, because um, where I was going was more around the broader strategy of how do you deal with, with nation states and foreign actors facilitating cyber attacks in the U.S. and how does the government respond, which I think everybody would agree with. It's something that the policy needs to be dealt with. On the vulnerabilities issue, I mean, I know there's things out there today like the National Vulnerability Database that people have. I know that U.S. CERT publishes vulnerabilities. So from a U.S. perspective, I mean, we work with, that, with them all the time. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there's anything that's been held back or not. But I think what Angela was speaking about was more some of the laws in Europe about requiring reporting of all these different breaches. So we're kind of getting into the, the conflating between like vulnerabilities and breaches and different issues on in one. No, I wasn't, I, I didn't mean to suggest that there was some giant database that, that the U.S. was kind of tapping into, but uh, there was a recommendation from the NSA review panel that, that that shouldn't happen, and that was, to my knowledge, unless that's changed, that was not a, a recommendation that the White House adopted. So it just, it suggests that there's, um, there, there is a kind of a balancing act that, that has to take place, and there is sort of an inherent tension between intelligence agencies that need to utilize these tools and the measures that need to be taken in order to protect, and I, you know, it's, it's always a matter of just trying to figure out how to strike that balance. So I would say we did adopt that recommendation, and we created the, we made sure that the, we reinvigorated the vulnerabilities equities process to make sure that we were disclosing the vast, vast majority of these uh, cases. Now, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why you want to make a vulnerability public the day that you find out about it, right? There's tons of reasons why that might be the case. The biggest being that if you do that, then everyone has to scurry to, to fix the problem uh, overnight, as we saw with something like Heartbleed, right? If you want to be able to give some time in order to do that, um, still, I think, you know, we, 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 can do, we can always do better, and I think we, we will be doing better, but I just, uh, I think there has been some reporting in this space that makes it sound as though the U.S. government um, is, is holding back on this. And, and as you said, I don't think there's been enough said to say that we did actually adopt that recommendation and move the vulnerabilities equity process further. All right, Schwartz, can you um, bring the, the NIST framework into this? Um, for, for people who haven't been following closely, what, what kinds of things is, um, is that framework going to encourage companies to do and, and how much progress we've seen? So this goes to a lot of what, what everyone was saying about the, some of the hygiene stuff. So Siobhan was talking about the 80% of things that are out there that we have solutions for today uh, and that uh, companies can be doing to protect themselves. This is exactly what the NIST framework was created for. I mean, the whole idea of it was that um, when, in, in you know, I talked about our 2011 uh, legislative package, in that was the idea of promoting uh, cybersecurity standards. Um, through that process, it kind of moved in the Senate in particular to an idea of uh, maybe we should do this in a voluntary way and create voluntary standards. Industry has an incentive enough to, to implement standards. We just have to put it out there what those are and they will do it. 
Um, and our view was that's, that would be a great step in this, in this direction and the way we want to move. We don't need law to do that. We can, ju we can, we can do this without a law. And the president put forward uh, Executive Order 13636, which had uh, two pieces to it. One was making sure that the government was doing a good job giving information to the private sector uh, and making sure that we were protecting privacy in doing it. And number two was that we were uh, creating this, this cybersecurity framework. Uh, and that the private sector would lead the framework under, under the convening power to, used by NIST, which NIST has done in many other ways in, in many other industries. Um, and uh, from all accounts on this, I think pretty much uh, that, that it has been a big success in terms of the private sector stepping up uh, and uh, working with, uh, with government entities and uh, working internationally to help to lay out a set of, uh, of cybersecurity standards that sit, sit in this framework. Um, the, the framework has five areas, uh, identify, uh, pr protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, and this goes to exactly what Alan was talking about in terms of, did I get those right? You got it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, no. Alan, we were talking about that before the conference, trying to remember all of them. <laughs> Alan, someone in the back. Uh, no, Alan um, was, so Alan was saying before that, uh, you, you know, you're never going to get rid of all. I mean, and that's that, that. I think that it looks at that as a kind of that this is kind of a, a an ongoing cycle of ways of addressing the issue, um, and the NIST framework really puts that in place in a way that can work in a lot of different kinds of sectors. Now, I think we've run into this issue where people say, "Well, we're not complying with the entire NIST framework." No, no one complies with every single thing in the NIST framework. The question is, are you using the framework? If you read. The, the framework, the way that it's written, um, it is it is written to take pieces of it that make sense. What makes sense for uh, a company that has uh, has control systems is going to be different than a company that uh, is a, than a than a retailer, right? And you've got to take the pieces that make sense for your company. Do risk management along this process. We've heard from a lot of companies that are now using this, um, and we've heard from companies that are requiring it of other companies in their contracts. We hear of. Um, insurance companies starting to take it on and starting to re require it so that as people buy cyber insurance that they, the, 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 the insurance company knows that they're giving it to someone that is taking responsibility in this space, that, they're build, that uh, sectors are building models around maturity models and other kind of models around the cybersecurity framework. And that way, for one year of existence, it has been a real success already. I think we can do a lot more um, in, the, in the next year, uh, in particular, uh, one of the things that uh, NIST did in, in putting together the framework was there were a bunch of things that were kind of on the cusp of being standardized, but were not standardized enough to put into the framework. And they created what, they, what they're calling a roadmap on that. And, and the question is, can we move some of these things um, that are in the, currently in the NIST roadmap to be standardized and, and can industry work on that piece of it to move those parts forward? And where do we stand on that today? I think that's really a question for the next, for year two of the, uh, of the framework. Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective, I, mean, I was intricately involved in the development of the framework and participated in all the various workshops with NIST. And I think, I think the beauty of the framework is the point that Ari pointed out about it being about risk management. You know, the way the framework is supposed to be worked within a company is that the company is, you know, if you look at the parts of the framework to talk about how to use it, it talks about companies kind of identifying their core mission, identifying the risks from a cybersecurity perspective to that mission, and then the framework provides them kind of a roadmap or what I'll call like a menu of different types of standards in those five categories to help them build a plan for mitigating those risks. So it's a constantly evolutionary thing where every, you know, you can, you can see over time, you'd be continually evaluating what are the risks to my mission and what parts of the framework best apply to dealing with those risks. And to me, that's the right model for cybersecurity. There's, you know, I'll give the administration and this credit that they didn't go down the path of just saying, here's a rigid set of standards you should do for cybersecurity, because that probably would be outdated the minute it was published and the attack would change and then those standards would be something else. So by, by bringing it down a risk management process, it becomes more of a process that you can build inside a company to deal with the attacks. And I think that's the right way to really deal with something that's always evolving like security. Um, and then I can speak specifically to some of the things that my sector's been doing. So like a lot of the sectors in, um, have been implementing the framework or trying to figure out how to use the framework. And so within communications, um, we, you know, we have an entity with the FCC called the Communication Security uh, Reliability and Interoperability Council, the CISRIC. And so we've been working for the last, oh, since last summer, on how to conform the framework to the communications sector. Um, there's been over 100 individuals involved in that, multiple nonprofits, universities, various government agencies, 
agencies. Um, and we're about to put out a report on March 15th that will talk about the ways that the communication sector anyway is conforming the framework. And it's really advising companies in the communication sector on how, giving them use cases and examples of how they could use the framework to, to try to protect um, what we call communications critical infrastructure. So it's, it's an example of what Ari's talking about, how different sectors have kind of embraced the framework and are trying to use it. And I think, you know, out of all the things we've dealt with here in security, um, it's, it's been a good work product and I think it's, gonna, it's been fairly successful over the last year. And I might add just one point, just kind of connect something earlier. I asked Siobhan about uh, has the conversation changed in cybersecurity, right. and she highlighted that it, there's an executive level conversation that's going on now. I think the framework is actually a really good tool. Cybersecurity historically was thought about as, you know, those technical people over there who are doing stuff, just stay out of my way, go over there. And, and then you had executives who are like, I don't know exactly how what this is, how to allocate my resources. And so the framework has provided a really good translation tool and helped technical folks who typically are in the standard space and are like, you know, this is the control I'm using, have a conversation with executives to say, how well am I doing in identify versus what I feel like I need to do. So, right, it's not a static, we all need to hit a point. It also says, what's my risk tolerance as an organization based on my missions and functions and the threats that I'm facing? And so I just kind of wanted to connect that, that initial part of the conversation to another value out of the framework. I, I, I want to get the audience in here. They're um, in the front. Is there a microphone? Yes, no, okay, go ahead. So this is a question for Ari. Um, I've been told, and I'm going to work this carefully, sorry. I've been told that there are discussions within the White House and the administration um, to build on this NIST framework, which by the way is great, and I love NIST, so that's, that's a positive. Um, but there, there are plans, there is discussion underway to pull triggers within the executive orders and within existing laws that would mandate cybersecurity requirements. And this would be coming about 2016 or toward the end of the Obama term. Now, the answer to that question isn't, are, is that true or false? It's, are you aware of these discussions? <laughs> also, when did you stop beating your wife? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll say that is entirely false. And I want to make that a, a, a categorical statement that that is false. Um, we are committed to the voluntary process in this space. We have worked with a lot of industries in this space that have, you know, direct rela good relationships with their, um, with their regulators. And we work with industries in this space that have terrible relationships with their regulators. And I think we have tried to work with them and come up with solutions that can work in that space and still keep this voluntary. Um, if you want to look at the kind of the ideal way that regulated industries can work with in this space, I would look at the, the, what the FDA has done, and uh, particularly around uh, medical devices. They put out voluntary guidance in this space that really spells out what uh, a medical device manufacturer could do um, to, com to use the framework in a way that um, addresses some of these concerns without tying it to any kind of very strict regulatory standards in the space. And we've heard really positive things from medical manufacturers around this. So that's the type of thing that we are promoting and we are trying to get out, uh, out there. Um, and you know, it's up to the independent regulators to kind of do what they're gonna do. We don't have oversight on that. And, 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 I mean, the ability to- So all those regulators that, that were we asking are, the EO voluntary. to come back to you if they needed additional regulatory authority to implement uh, all the cybersecurity stuff. All of those regulators that came back to the White House, are they asking for more regulatory authority? Can we expect more regulatory well, no, authority from agencies? We've stated, we stated publicly, and Michael Daniel put out a blog post on this. You, you can go back and read. We received no one that said that they need additional authorities. No regulator said that they do. Uh, but I think that's, I mean, just to add to that question, I mean, I think there's, I think from, uh, from at least from my perspective, there's still a concern, right, on the industry side that um, the, the framework could be taken out of context. I think uh, Ari's right. The administration has been very much on the record that it's a voluntary program. They've said all the right things about that. Can't control what independent agencies do, so I, th so I still think that's a concern that's out there. But um, what we've seen so far has not not been that. So we'll see what happens over time. But it's an on it's, it is an ongoing issue. Uh oh, he's wrong. Oh, this is truly a This is wow, fantastic. <laughs> Bill Thanks, Tim. Uh, hi, uh, Kevin Banks in New America's Open Technology Institute. Um, this is a question for Ari, but also for the entire panel. Uh, first off, thanks for bringing up and discussing the issue of vulnerabilities equities and the stockpiling or lack thereof 
uh, of vulnerabilities in the government. I wanted to raise a, a related issue around the growing private marketplace for vulnerability information. There are people who discover and then sell vulnerabilities often to people other than the vendors who could patch those vulnerabilities and instead to those who could exploit them. Um, the question is, for the entire panel, what do you think is the appropriate role of government in participating in or not participating in or regulating such markets? Noting that some people like Dan Gere at InQtel have said, the US should actually corner the market and buy up everything and then disclose it to the vendors and drive up the price, while others would say that the US government participating in the market at all uh, is, is not a morally acceptable thing to do. Uh, and then more directly to Ari, is there any position in the government right now in terms of policy around how you deal with this market? I mean, so, so this has been a question in the economics infosec world for uh, almost two decades now. Uh, and in fact, actually, if anything, we're now back to where we started. Uh, you know, when I started uh, thinking about this question, it was uh, only our, if you're assume you're a good-hearted security researcher who just wants to make the internet safe, should you announce it publicly or should you disclose it privately to the vendor? A Angela may have some opinions on, on that. But I think the problem is there is no single space, uh, even for similar types of vulnerabilities, uh, how we should treat something in an industrial control system that's used widely is very different than how we should treat something in a piece of in a thin client that's uh, according to the cloud piece of cloud software. Um, and then you sort of just add that actually there already are lots of people who are buying it up defensively. Uh, there's a huge market. Uh, in fact, I would say that the largest marketplace now, from what I know that's publicly discussed, is not governments discuss, uh, trying to buy things. It's third party vendors that want to sell you security that Microsoft can't give you. Uh, and that's where you're, if you're, you're looking to make you know, the, the, the greatest expected value as a security researcher, that's who you're selling to, to now. And I might add just a little bit here. Um, so first of all, there is a philosophical debate in the security community that has been going on for over 20 years around what's the right way to motivate and incentivize behavior towards managing risk. And there are at least three schools of thought. There is the, we should tell everyone because it'll make things, people resource fixing faster. Um, I call it, you know, that's the broad disclosure approach. There is an approach that is based on time, which says we'll report to a vendor, but there will be a specific time frame in which a vulnerability should be fixed. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and disclose it publicly and also put out exploit code. So that will then again incentivize behavior. And then there's a third school of thought called coordinated vulnerability disclosure that says we're going to report it to the vendor. And as long as the vendor is keeping in touch with the reporter and let letting them know that there are appropriate actions being taken to ultimately address that vulnerability, that they would not go public. Um, I think what's important inside of that um, is understanding that not all vulnerabilities are created equal, which is something Alan was just kind of alluding to. Whether you're talking about the exploitability of a vulnerability, so how easy is it to access? There was somebody who dropped a vulnerability, a Microsoft vulnerability out in the ecosystem and it all made all this news. And you had to have physical access to the machine and authorized credentials to get through the vulnerability. So not saying that that's not serious, but that's very different than something where you could have logical access and no credentials. Um, and also, uh, so there's the exploitability piece. And the second piece is the consequence associated with the vulnerability. Again, not all vulnerabilities are going to have the same impact to systems. And so you have to think about uh, both of those when you think about this process. Um, from a Microsoft point of view, we also, um, uh, do not typically have what you call the typical bug bounties where you're going and paying for vulnerabilities to come to you. There's two things that we have done. Um, first of all, we have incentivized and have a bounty program for security researchers to give us um, um, mitigations to classes of vulnerabilities. So we're really trying to incent, don't just go and find vulns, but use your creativity to come up with ways to mitigate against vulns. Um, that's one thing. And then the second thing is also providing a window when a, a, a product is in beta and saying, hey, it's not broadly out there yet. It's not broadly being used. So if you can report vulnerabilities to us during this beta window, we're going to do as much fixing in that as possible. But once we move into the product being out, out, we would not be paying for vulnerabilities being reported to us. It's a very philosophical argument at this point. And I think uh, just kind of getting into the role of government question, first of all, almost all governments are already in this marketplace in one way, shape, or form or the other. 
um, that it's directly or through some of their um, uh, defense industrial base vendors, not just here domestically, but internationally. And I think you really have to go into game theory and play this out a pretty long way before you can come up with a solid answer on the right thing to do. I, uh, I got a question uh, related to uh, the IPv6. In order to use support the future growth of internet, especially when we need to support the inno innovations and uh, technologies related to internet, such as uh, internet of things, we have to adopt as a global community the IPv6. And uh, even though not everybody on the panel may totally agree with that, but the reality is, in order to make a IoT a reality, IPv6 has to be uh, adopted globally. So the, the question to the panel is, while we, we are struggling on a daily basis dealing with the security-related breaches and attacks on the IPv6, on the IPv4 stack, and how can we, as a community deal with the additional security threat and attack from the IPv6. And uh, what would be the policies and uh, how the vendors, particularly in the private sectors, to help to move that uh, global adoption uh, become the reality? Thank you. I mean, I can start and say, I mean, from, I mean, I definitely agree with you that we have to move to IPv6, that's without question. Um, you know, from, from an ISP perspective, I mean, we are in the midst of migrating our services to V6 now. We've been doing quite a bit of an effort. We've had a program office for several years, dating back to like 2009 or 2008, that was kind of managing our migration of our network to V6. So it's, it's going to happen. So that's without question. And it certainly is relevant for the Internet of Things. I mean, the, the more devices that you have connected to the Internet, the more IP addresses you need. So obviously you're going to need more. Uh, you're going to have to go to V6 to support that in the long run. Um, from a security perspective, I think the thing that worries me the most about IoT is that you just have so many devices. So like today, you know, it's easier to manage the less devices you have. So the more devices you put on the internet, the, the harder it's going to be to manage security. And the model for security for a long time was kind of a perimeter defense. So you, you put the security at the perimeter, you know, you put antivirus on your device, and that's how you do protection. And I think in the long run, with IoT, the, you're going to have to shift that whole mindset where the security is not no longer on the perimeter, uh, but so you basically put security in the network. And, you know, if my uh, chief security officer was here, what he's been talking a lot about recently has been the whole concept of security in the cloud and this idea of virtualized security. So if you move to an environment where, uh, if you move to a long-term environment where um, you have devices out in the field and they're communicating with virtualized instances in the cloud, you can create security that wraps around the virtual, the virtualized instances. So it's a, it's a true model of virtualization. And so then if you, if there's an attack, uh, what happens is, is that you only have access into that one particular instance, but you have the security layer around each one of these different instances. So it makes it easier to recover. It's much more resilient. And if they, if, if you get into one of these particular elements, uh, you only have access to that particular element. The rest of the perimeter, the rest of the network is, is, is is basically protected still, or still, so it's more of like a distributed model for security, not not too unlike how some of the attackers build their botnets. Um, so if you go down that path, um, there's th that's really the long-term evolution, I think, of security and the way these services are going to work. So um, I don't know if it's really like flaws with V6 per se that you're asking about, but I think in the long run there is a need for uh, V6 certainly, and I think um, in terms of uh, security, it's going to shift more to the network level and into the cloud, and, there, and some of these newer technologies are going to be the way we're going to have to deal with that issue. But that's a five to ten year, to me, that's a long-term evolutionary issue um, as we move down the IoT path. So I think just very, very quickly, there are three things going on that make IPv6 different. So you've got your switches, your network applications, and then your number of devices. So from the switches, uh, NetFlow data and data analysis is currently optimized for an IPv4 environment. Uh, so we really have to turn to the CERT community and say, listen, do better, come up with better tools for network analytics uh, that are optimized around IPv6. It's a very technical question. Uh, from a network application perspective, I'd much rather have everything throw, flow through my NAT uh, than have everything be globally addressable, right? I, the nice thing about a sort of the current IPv4 is everything's already flowing through a local box. So I can do my packet inspection, I can do all my security in one nice chunk. Why would I want to have a more decentralized network that IPv6 enables uh, from a security perspective? So it's a more concentrated security posture. And that gets to the number of devices. Uh, why would I want a whole bunch of globally addressable things in my factory? 
I'd much rather have everything talking to the local switch so I can control it. Uh, because that way no one can actually talk to it without going through my network as opposed to somehow routing around it. Um, all right, I, I want to see, do you want to say anything about Kevin's previous question about government purchasing vulnerabilities or regulating that market? So I have a totally unsatisfying answer to that question, which is that um, I don't really, I don't, I don't think that we have a policy, but I'm not 100% positive. So, I mean, I will take it back and find out and respond to Kevin directly. But uh, for everyone else, I mean, I think that's something that the, the, the whole discussion that was had over here about uh, uh, the dis uh, vulnerabilities disclosure process, both in the private sector and with the government and researchers' involvement in that and how vendors d respond uh, is something that we are having, uh, is, a, is an extremely important discussion that we've been having um, on a regular basis with a lot of different parts of a lot of different agencies. Uh, and it's something that I think you can expect to hear a lot more about from us in the near future, so. Thanks for taking my question. Um, yeah, so my question has to do with the end users themselves. Um, you know, I think a lot of the conversation today has been about government policy, about industry best practices, uh, and I think you haven't really said much about what's the plan for citizen engagement and awareness. How do we educate the public? Uh, I think it's worth pointing out that the internet is the least trusted sector of our economy, if you believe the Poneman data. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, but uh, so, you know, I think ultimately if, if the proposals and the policy, policies don't actually address the underlying uh, lack of trust that consumers have and they continue to be the source of identity theft, breach notices, media reports, you know, et cetera, I wonder about uh, whether you have the right policy agenda. So any, any comment on, on you know, is there a plan to actually engage our citizenry on the importance of these issues? We talk to that. You want to go first? Um, so there, I mean, that's something that's actually been going on for quite a while now. There's, um, I, so in, in full disclosure, I serve on the board of an organization called the National Cybersecurity Alliance, which is an organization that consists of, ironically enough, Microsoft and AT&T, <laughs> um, and a few others uh, that are not here. Um, but that, that group, uh, I see Rudy here from Comcast, so they're a member as well. Um, so it's, uh, it's an organization that's whole mission is to educate the public on cybersecurity issues. It's really, uh, it's intended to develop what's called, what I would call the Smokey the Bear type of campaign for security. So it's really to raise awareness amongst the general populace at large, you know, what the importance of cybersecurity, it talks about how, um, you know, uh, cybersecurity is, uh, is a, what is it, what do we usually call it, it's a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not just about you, but it's also about everybody else, so your actions as a end user affect your friends and your neighbors and everyone else on security, so it's a, it's a collective effort, um, and, th and they've been doing, um, they have a campaign called the, the Stop, Think, Connect, I don't know if anybody in the audience has heard of it, but it's been going on for quite a while. We launched that in 2009, um, and it's really focused on raising awareness on security. They do, an, they run the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is every October. That's partnered with DHS, and uh, the big focus of that is Stop, Think, Connect, and they also do uh, Data Privacy Day, which is actually coming up uh, tomorrow. So. so let me add, I mean, we also, uh, the, the administration has requested money for the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education basically every year in, in, of our existence in every budget, and this is the first year in, in, in uh, FY15 where we're, that's actually being funded. So I feel like we're moving in a good direction there in terms of building that. Of course, a lot of that has to do also with training workforce too, which is a huge issue in this space. Um, we don't, we, um, I like to point out that we have negative unemployment for cybersecurity right now, uh, and, and if you look at the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics data on this. So uh, that's a key point to that, but it's also educating the public as well and uh, working in that space too. Um, just a, a couple points. Um, one, I think, again, kind of the overall uh, salience of the issue is significantly higher now than it was a year ago. And I think that while that's true, that, that sort of raises awareness for people in companies that might not have been focusing on it, I think that that's also true for the public. But it's going to take much longer for it to filter out just to the average public person because, again, the incentives there are a little bit different, um, as we discussed before. I mean, having your identity stolen um, obviously isn't something that people are seeking out. But even that we're kind of now seeing happen um, on a, you know, a not infrequent basis. And so uh, it's it's going to be a matter of, of time, I think, for the public to kind of absorb that there are things that, that 
every computer user can do in, in order to try to reduce the chances at least of that happening. Um, then in it, in, and to just reiterate Ari's point, I do think that there is a, a much higher awareness um, within companies these days of the importance of educating their workforce to the degree that they can about um, the, the kinds of security risks uh, that they can help reduce. And companies have a strong incentive to do that just because they're trying to reduce their own vulnerabilities. That's actually a big component of the October efforts. Like a lot of companies will do uh, internal, and I know AT&T does this every October, is we do a huge effort around you know, engaging our internal employees about security safety because you know, the end user ultimately is probably the biggest, big, the weakest link in the chain. Um, that's, e that's usually how a lot of these attacks are facilitated. So uh, we make a pretty concerted effort every year to educate our employees around, around safe, safe practices, safe computing practices, and that's the mission for the campaign to the general consumer as well. As you pointed out, it's it's a it's a tough issue because you know you're trying to get people to pay attention to something, and the life you know uh, people have short attention spans, and it's tough to get out there. But it's something that we're actively working on. I'd also like to point out. I mean, I think you know we're trying to get more, trying to build our policy around getting more things for that consumers actually can do to protect themselves. And like chip chip and pin cards are, is a key example of that we put out this executive order with the goal of getting more readers out there and getting more people with chip cards so that when a consumer can actually starts requesting it of their, of their bank, they actually can get a chip card. And when they go to the store, they have somewhere to use it, right? So um, we did that for the federal government trying to promote this October deadline that's coming up for the liability shift, which will move more merchants to have, um, have readers. And we're starting to see more consumers starting to get cards now. So th you can start to do more education around that for people to request it and to know what to do with that and to know that, like if you have the choice, stick it into the uh, stick your card into the chip reader part. Don't don't swipe. Right, that those types of things um, that we can move uh, move the discussion more towards th ways to to educate consumers um, rather than them not having any choices in this space. Um, let me let me ask. Maybe Alan Friedman can take this first. Um, how much different? So so we've got a company, couple companies on this panel um, that have probably dozens of full time security um, professionals that are worrying about this all the time. <laughs> um, it, maybe hundreds. I don't know. A large number. Literally hundreds. <laughs> Microsoft um, Research hires more computer science PhDs than anyone else on the planet. Uh, all right. So so many many. And then you got like the you know the chiropractic practice in Atlanta who may not even have a full time <laughs> IT person. And in sometimes sure. But when we're like talking talking about companies securing their networks, you have this huge disparity in both the vulnerability and the capabilities they have, and a framework that Microsoft and AT&T can go out and, you know, obviously I've, I assume the chiropractic practice is not thinking about the NIST framework. Um, and so are there, thi are there things that policymakers can be doing or that um, services available to companies at the kind of lo low end of that spectrum to help deal with this, or are those companies just going to have to kind of be in the same boat as regular consumers where just you get hacked sometimes and there's nothing you can do about it? So uh, the challenge at a certain level, security requires cognition, right? It's true at the basic user level. We want to be using our computers for the reason that we want to use them. But security, in order to make a security decision, you actually need to interrupt what you're working on to make a security decision. That's even more true at the organizational level. There are so many more things I should be working on right now other than security. Uh, and I didn't used to have to think about security as a small business owner. Now I actually have to. Uh, as much as I, I, I think your average medium-sized business, we're past the hygiene point, even just you know doing the SANS top 20 or something, that's not sufficient. Um, because, so, so there's, there, anyone know who HD Moore is? Uh, there's a, a HD Moore developed Metasploit, which is a toolkit that allows you to do pen testing. Uh, but it means that any time there's an exploit on the internet, uh, it's going to be slotted in. And so there's someone coined the term HD Moore's Law as a response to the famous Moore's Law on the internet, which is if you don't have an information technology program that moves at least as fast as Metasploit, that is to say, every time there's a new vulnerability on the internet, even if it doesn't have a special logo, because you know the logo ones, those are the really important vulnerabilities, uh, you have to actually make sure that somehow your system is patching. If you don't have that in-house, you need to make sure that you have the organizational capacity that your vendors do. You can't just handle payment in a turnkey, do it once. You should be paying someone to make sure that they're doing this as well. And if you can find someone who has a contract that says they promise to do it, that's even better. 
but I don't think I don't think anyone's offering that kind of contract yet. Uh, and if I can just put in one very quick challenge on the workforce side, uh, since we've talked about uh, gender as the unofficial theme of, of State of the Net this year, um, as bad as it is in all of computer science, information security is probably ten times worse. There are a number of different scholarships out there. There are a number of different programs trying to bring more women uh, into the field. But it really is, it's probably the worst part of diversity in, in all of information technology. So uh, anything that the government can do or companies can do, and a number of, number of companies are doing this, uh, because so much of the practical knowledge is informal. It's done through mentorships, and that's traditionally one of the biggest weak links in, in computer science education. That's my plug. I, th I think the short answer on the small and medium business question is really outsourcing the services. I mean, and ultimately, you know, a lot of companies here, and the, the mine and others, um, offer managed security services that are really targeted for that audience because you can't expect every you know mom and pop store out there, you know, to have a cybersecurity expert. And they barely, you know, they might have two, three people. Their their IT guy might be their 18-year-old kid or whoever, right? And so, you know, uh, they expect them to understand all these security issues. And the world that we're in now is just really unrealistic. And so, I think ultimately moving towards these managed security solutions that companies can offer them. And I think Alan's right that they still need to know a little bit. They got to be able to ask questions of their supplier to basically you know, understand what their security posture is. They can't just totally ignore it, but um, they're much better off leveraging the expertise of, of some of these services than trying to do it themselves, in my opinion. Yeah, this actually ties exactly to what I said earlier about different player sets have different needs. If you don't understand cyber threats, just pushing a bunch of malware signatures out to my sister in Atlanta is not necessarily going to help her a lot. What you can help her do is understand the nature of the threat, give her a 20-page framework document and say, hey, you should probably talk with your vendor about if you're doing these things. All right, uh, <laughs> you go ahead. One, one small thing, at least in terms of medium-sized businesses, one, one thing that I've seen of late is uh, at least medium-sized businesses starting to realize that they need to at least know enough to start asking questions, and I think that that's a relatively recent trend. Um, and so it suggests at least an awareness that even people who don't feel that security is their primary responsibility at a company need to at least um, be able to start asking some questions to kick the tires a little bit. I mean, I've heard this from like medium-sized businesses that are extremely technically a Dude, actually, where they'll say, like, we have two or three people that do our IT services, and, and they're completely overwhelmed, and all they're doing is security, right? What can we do? And I get to this question of managed, you know, have you looked into managed services? Have you looked into putting more services into the cloud, even for a medium-sized company? Because really, it, that, that's where we've come to at this point for the, getting to real solutions past just hiring more and more IT. All right, so we have a privacy panel that I think is supposed to start in one minute. Oh, no. um, so uh, <laughs> you do a quick bathroom break or whatever, but then come right back here if you want to do privacy. Mm -hmm.